If not, you would know, I think it was the birds did everything, turn, 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 or in my lifetime, it was Cindy Lauper's time after time. <laughs> There's been a lot of songs written about time. Well, I want to pick it apart a little bit because that's one of those scripture verses that we just kind of mull through, but do we really ever think about it? Now, who here can tell me who actually wrote Ecclesiastes? Somebody who was not at the last service. Nobody? King Solomon. Why is this man who was given gifted wisdom? He wrote Proverbs, and then he wrote Ecclesiastes. He also wrote the Song of Solomon. So there is a little bit of a poet, poetic justice to this and how it is written. And he starts out for a time for everything. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Now, if you have kids, you know that there is a season for every activity in school, right? Football, volleyball, basketball, golf, track, you know, softball. There's a, a season for everything. Right now, I think we're in one act of the show that will be speech. And they end a marching band. But is that what he's getting at? No, he's getting at there's a season for every activity, everything that we do. Now, I underline this part, under the heavens. Nobody looks at that part. Got to skip right over it. See, in heaven, there is no time. There is no space. It is all interconnected, and it's all infinity. It's only in the earth where we are bound by time and by space. So the only way there can be seasons is here on earth. Okay? And it says there's a time to be born and a time to die. How many times can you be born physically? Just once. And how many times can you die for good? Just once. We're not cats. We don't have nine lives. I want you to think about that. That is what is fine. There's only one time that you can be born physically. And there's only one time that you can die. So that dash that's in between, what are you doing with that time? What are you doing with all of those seasons? Because you'll never be born again physically. Jesus had this little interaction with Nicodemus. And he poses that. He says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, I don't understand. It's not like I can be born again from my mother's womb. God rest her soul. She's been dead. She says, no, 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 no. You must be born again through the water and the spirit to enter heaven. But physically, there's just that one time. They said there's a time to plant and a time to uproot. Now, if you're a farmer... This takes on a little different meaning, right? You prepare the soil in the spring so that way you can plant your seeds. And then in the fall, you don't just harvest it. You usually go in what? With a disc and you plow it under. If you have a garden or a flower bed in the fall, what do you typically do? You get it ready by going in and clearing out all the old dead stuff so that way it's ready for the spring. Now, if you're in another part of the world, say Israel, or even California, there's two plantings, isn't there? There's two times to plant, and two times to harvest. It says, now there's a time to kill and a time to heal. I thought this was fitting, being on Veterans Weekend. That is kind of a contradictory, isn't it? There's a time to kill, but then Moses gave us the Ten Commandments, says what? Thou shalt not it seems like a conflict of interest, doesn't it? And yet, the Bible is full. The scriptures are full of times when God told Saul, he told David, he told Samson, he told Gideon, he told all the men. Elijah, we looked at that last week. Those that it was time to kill. But then there was always a time to heal. Joshua was the last one in his men. It was a time to kill as they were getting ready to come into the promised land. But then there was a time of healing and restoration as they came into that place. For a lot of our veterans, 
They didn't have a choice when they were drafted or even volunteered to serve our country. There was a time, unfortunately, to kill. But the problem is we leave it right there for a lot of them. They have missed the spot of a time to heal, a time to restore their soul and to move on. This is a time to tear down and a time to build up. We think of that in the physical terms, right? How about if you're thinking about it inward? There is a time if we are going to grow, you cannot continue to keep growing unless you start pruning even yourself. So there is a time to tear yourself down in a good way to look at what needs to be changed. What do I need to better myself on? What do I need to grow in? And then there's that time to build up. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Did you notice though with each of these, it doesn't say that we're supposed to weep forever and we're supposed to mourn forever. There is a time for that. And then there is a time to move on. When we talked about this appreciation bit, it's that appreciating just being when you're at in the moment. Everybody grieves differently. There's no right or wrong way to grieve. There's no time limit necessarily on how long it is to grieve or to mourn. But then there needs to be that time of not getting stuck there, but a time of moving on, a time of laughing at the wonderful memories, a time of dancing again. David, I think, was probably one of the best examples in Scripture of somebody who went from opposites <laughs> on that teeter-totter. He's a perfect example of what it was like to throw himself all out there on God's mercy, to scream and cry and weep and mourn. But at the same time, he showed the opposite of what it was like when that time was over, to laugh and to dance and to be in the joy of the Lord. It says there's a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. Has anybody else ever wondered about that line? That oh, made sense to me. Time to scatter stones. For those of you who have been watching The Chosen and done the Bible study, on the first episode of season two, there's a very good description of this. There's a time when Jesus there in Samaria. <laughs> And he asked James and John go to clear out a field. And the problem is, before they can clear out this field, it was in Israel. <laughs> and it's all rock. So before they could plow this field, what did they have to do? They had to move the rock. They had to scatter the stones. They had to kick them off to the side and prepare the way for the seed. <laughs> the temple was another one. It was predicted twice that the temple would fall. Now you have to realize, Solomon, when he wrote this, he was already predicting his very own temple that he just created would be tumbled down. And that's exactly what happened when the Babylonians came in and destroyed that temple. And then again, Jesus said when that temple had been rebuilt again, a time to gather them and to build up the walls and to build up the temple, Jesus is very truly, I tell you, not one of these stones will remain. It will all be torn down. And the year 70 AD is exactly what happened when Rome came in and destroyed the temple yet again. There was a time to scatter, but a time to gather. And metaphorically, the Israelites were scattered at that moment. But in 1948, when Israel became a nation again, it was the time of gathering and bringing them back together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Now for those of you who are married, you might be scratching your head a little bit on this. But it's not talking so much about married couples, it's talking about relationships in general. I want you to think about Jacob and Esau. Oh my gosh, were they not the typical family? 
the Warring Brothers. It was a time to refrain from embracing, but then there was a time of restoration, a time of forgiveness, a time of coming back together, and how did they greet each other? With embracing. We see that throughout all of Scripture, that there is a time for refraining and a time for forgiveness and a time for embracing and healing and coming back home. This is a time to search and a time to give up. <laughs> Who here's ever looked for their keys or their phone? <laughs> right? Time to search. We're searching, searching, and then you kind of give up. It could be physical. Of course, you know, how many times have you finally said, okay, and you just quit looking, and then what shows up? The very thing you're looking for. But what if this is not talking about that? What if Solomon, in his wisdom, is talking about God? What did Jesus say? Search, ask, seek, knock. The time of searching. But then there's a time to give up. That's the English version. Yeah, the Greek, not so much. What it's saying is a time, basically, for rest. If you've been searching and searching and seeking and asking, before God's going to tell you what, you need that time, like we looked at last week, a pause. You need that time of rest to wait for him to give you the answer, to show you what you've been searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. Anyone here at orders? Anyone here? If you're not laughing, then you're married to order, right? A time to keep. Who else? Is it just me that you will keep something for 20, 30 years and the day you throw it away, two days later or a week later? It's exactly when you need what you have. But there is a time to keep and a time to throw away. There is something very healing about going in and getting rid of that which has cluttered our lives, that which has taken up our time, that which has taken up our energy. You know, I've always told my kids, I'm already clearing things out so that way they have less to have to go through <laughs> when I'm gone. If you haven't had that talk with your parents, do it now. You'll thank me for it later. A time to tear and a time to mend. <coughs> See, in biblical times, when somebody was in complete anguish, when they were looking for the mercy of God, when they were looking for forgiveness, what they did was they would tear their clothes and they would put on sackcloth and ashes and they would sit in solitude and pray for forgiveness and mercy. But it was a time. There was an ending to that. And at the ending of that time of asking for forgiveness, there was a time of mending, a time of getting in. Getting up, taking that sackcloth off, washing their face, and putting on new clothes, and mending that which was torn, because God had heard their prayers. This is a time to be silent and a time to speak. Let me ask you this: Have there been times when you just really wanted to give somebody your two cents? You just really wanted to say something in the worst way, and God went, hmm. Right? Now, it doesn't mean that what you wanted to say was necessarily wrong. It just might have been the wrong timing. Or maybe you would have done it in the wrong way. And it's just a time to speak. How many here have ever sat on their hands going, oh, I should say something, but I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't normally speak up. And yet the Spirit compels you to get up and say exactly what God wants you to say. And when you say it in those times, it changes hearts. It changes decisions. It can move mountains and build bridges. This is a time to love and a time to hate. And you may be thinking, I didn't think we were supposed to hate. But Jesus says, Hate unrighteousness. Hate injustice. Hate ungodliness. Love your enemies as yourself. Love with an unconditional love. 
a time for war and a time for peace. This kind of goes along with Veterans Day again. There is a time for war. The scriptures are full of time that God called his people, his men and women, into war. But then it was just for a time. Then there was a time of healing and a time of peace. I think of how this is even mirroring in Revelation. Jesus tells us that when we get to the end, there will be wars and rumors of wars. But then, when Christ returns, there will be a millennial reign and a time for peace. A time of healing of the nations. 1 Corinthians, Paul, in chapter 13, he says, When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. Then I became a man. And I put those childish things behind me. See, there is a time for everything. When you are a new Christian, when you are just learning things for the first time, you're, you're receiving God like a child, the innocence of a child. You're taking it on as though formula, right? Soft food. But then there's a time... When you've hungered enough, you dig in and you dig deeper and deeper and deeper. Did you put away that bottle and you start pulling out a steak knife and a fork? And you start chewing on the word. We're going to look at that one a little later in a few weeks. I'm going to go back to Solomon a little bit because in verse 11, to wrap this up, he says... He has made everything. God has made everything beautiful in its time. I want you to think about that. We're talking about war and peace. We're talking about killing and healing. We're talking about mourning and dancing. Do you realize that? That everything is beautiful in its time, but it has an expiration date. He has also said eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. See, we live right here, under heaven, in time. There is a beginning, there is an end. In the beginning, God created, and in the end, he creates a new heaven and earth. But in heaven, there is no time. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. Now, this happy, again, is kind of a little mistranslation because it's not happy you think of it as emotion, right? And it's based on your circumstances. Are you happy when you're mourning? No. Are you happy when you're sad? No. But if you inserted joy in there, for nothing is better for people than to be joyful in all things, in all ways, in all time, and to do good while they live. I think this is very fitting for this time. This time that we're living in. There's so much going on, the good and the bad, and, and time seems to be getting away from us and out of hand. I don't know about you, but does it just seem like you blink and the days are gone, and the weeks are gone, and the months are gone, and the year is gone. This is a year that should have seemed like it was lasting three or four years, and yet, it has been gone in a blink of an eye. God is in control of time. And he's telling us through this message, what are you doing with that time? The good times and the bad times. Don't get stuck in one place because it has an expiration on it. You will move on. You need to move on. And if you are in that spot where right now you feel like you're that maybe that baby Christian that Paul was talking about, it's time for you to move out of being spoon-fed. And it's time to dig in and learn for yourself so that way you can go and start igniting the spark in others and helping feed them until they get to the time where they're ready to dig in deeper too. So as you go out these doors, I would encourage you and challenge you to take this time to ponder a little deeper on this passage. Where are you at in your life right now and what is God calling you to move into? What time are you getting ready to see in the future? Maybe you're stuck in a place where you just want to let go of it. 
God is saying, now is the time. Now is the time to follow me. Now is the time to look for my love. Now is the time to look for my peace. Now is the time to look for my excitement. Because what I have in store for you next, you're going to need the time for.